Good afternoon and welcome. It is such a pleasure to welcome everyone here to this very special Zoom session. One of the biggest questions in the Jewish world today is who is Naftali Bennett, the new Prime Minister of Israel? And we have the perfect people to answer that question. Our main speaker today is Professor Chaba Nicoleni, who is the director of the Azraeli Institute of Israel Studies at Concordia University, and also a professor currently in Berlin, Germany. Before Professor Chaba begins, I want to first thank Stu Gutman, our programming director, for handling all of the arrangements and the technical support. And it is a great pleasure to be able to welcome a dear friend, Nina Glick, formerly of Montreal, now living with her husband, Rabbi Mordechai Glick, in Teaneck, New Jersey. And Nina will share with us a brief personal insight to Naftali Bennett and his family from their time here in Montreal. It is my pleasure to introduce Nina Glick. Thank you so much. And it is my pleasure to kind of believe I'm in Montreal at this moment, even though Mr. Trudeau has not allowed me to come there for quite a long time, but I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to be in touch with those of you who I know who have been like family to me over all the years that we lived in Montreal, and to tell you all that you should not forget what a wonderful place you're living in, because I want you to know that I miss it terribly. When a few years after we arrived in Montreal, I was asked to be the chairperson of a committee at Federation called the Welcoming Committee. That was a time when new people were moving to Montreal. And I was the chairperson of this committee. We would get the names of people that were arriving in the city and invite them to come to our committee and speak to them, ladies particularly, what they needed, if we could help them, if we could gear them in specific directions and whatever. And lo and behold, a lady by the name of Myrna Bennett came to this meeting one day. I knew nothing about Myrna Bennett, except that she arrived from Haifa with her husband and three boys. Her husband was representing the Technion and he was going to be the Shaliach, which means that he was doing publicity, he was doing fundraising, and he was doing um, an information about the Technion, which is in Haifa to give information to people in the city of Montreal and their stay was for two years. Myrna and I hit it off right away. And as a result, it was our custom and we, thank God, we're always thrilled to have company in our home. So we immediately invited the Bennets to join our family for Shabbat. The Bennett family, uh, Myrna and Jim Bennett, the parents of Naftali are both from San Francisco, both from extremely secular Jewish families. And at that time, they were very sort of um, they hippie-ish, I would say, and they joined the Peace Corps, which was something that was not very common amongst Jewish people, certainly that I knew. In their travels while they were in the Peace Corps, on a, on a vacation, they just went to Israel, liked what they saw, and decided that when they finished their stint at the Peace Corps, they were going to move to Israel, and they did so. They moved to Haifa a beautiful, beautiful neighborhood in the Haifa called Khuza. And then several years later, Jim took on this role as being the Shaliyah, the representative for Technion. So here they were in Montreal with three boys, Naftali the youngest, Asher the oldest, and Danny the middle. Naftali was two years old when he came to Montreal. And they lived in NDG. They had no thought about being involved in the Jewish community. The children were signed up to go to totally secular nurseries or whatever. And then for better or for worse, they met the Glicks and their life sort of made a major turnaround because I'm very proud to say that as a result of our friendship, they became Shoma Shabbat. And um, after spending many Chagim with us and many Shabbatot with us, um, Changed, took their children out of the schools they attended. And uh, Naftali actually went to the Hebrew Academy by the time he was two and four. And I think the other boys went to, he went to Talmud Torah, if I'm not mistaken. But the most incredible, unbelievable thing that I can talk about with regard to the family is this total 
total turn in their life and the gratitude that they have never ever stopped sharing with us with regard to the fact that we encourage them to become more involved in their Judaic lives. And it's amazing to me. I recently received a picture from Myrna because I'm in touch with her all the time, prior to her son becoming the prime minister, of course. And she sent me a picture of Naftali's putting on to fill in and I wrote back and I said, I'm so proud, Myrna. And she said, Nina, you don't understand. Everything in our life is because of you and Mordecai. And I am uncomfortable repeating that, but I'm repeating it because for two reasons. One is because people don't know the effect that their local rabbi can have on so many people. And I'm specifically stating it because you have an amazing rabbi who has an equally amazing effect on people. We were in that position. And what it meant to us that they turned around their whole lives and blame us. And thank God they're blaming us for something good. That's pretty good because sometimes they blame the rabbi and something bad. But this was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for us and for them. And we created an amazing friendship. And I had the opportunity several years ago, Naftali Bennett was speaking at Yeshiva University. And since we, we live in Teaneck and it's directly, of course, the uh, George Washington Bridge on the other side of the George Washington Bridge is Washington Heights. Where Yeshiva University is located, I said, let's go, let's go here, Naftali. And they took one of my grandchildren with us, his grandson, who was already, I believe, in his first year at YU. And we, we thoroughly embarrassed him all the time. So he came with us. And um, I asked the guard at the door if he could please explain to us where Naftali Bennett was. And he sent us up, which he shouldn't have done, to Richard Joel's office. Richard Joel was the, at that time the president of Yeshiva University sent us up to his office. He should have really sent us to the auditorium where Naftali was going to be speaking. And we came to Richard Joel's office to a conference room where, the, where there was a table with many, many students, student leaders from different organizations and Naftali at the head of the table. And he was discussing with each student where they were in school, what they were doing, and each one would give their role in terms of their um, relationship with Israel. And he'd say, you've got to come to Israel. You've got to come to Israel. We need you. We need you in Israel. You have to come. When he finished speaking, I went over to him and I said, Naftali, hi, it's me, Nina Glick, how are you? And he, he just took up his kippah immediately. He said, hey, everyone, everyone, you have to hear this. And he took up his kippah and he said, everyone in the room has to know, my poor grandson was so embarrassed, that the reason that I'm wearing this today is because of these two people. And when he went downstairs to speak, and it was standing room only, we actually didn't have seats, it was about a thousand people, he insisted that before he began to speak, he had to acknowledge the fact that we were present and that his family's commitment to Yiddishkeit was really because of the path that we had placed them on with regard to being more observant. And now when I think about it, and when I speak to Myrna, which is lately extremely frequently, and my Kids say to me, Ma, you're talking to the Prime Minister of Israel's mother. I say, no, but she's my friend. I can't help it if she's the Prime Minister of Israel's mother. But she's the Prime Minister of Israel's mother. I say, no, but I know her as Myrna Bennett. I don't know her as the Prime Minister of Israel's mother. So th that's my little tidbit. We are very, very proud of the Bennetts. We're very proud of where they have gone in their lives. It's a very, very special, wonderful, warm feeling for us that this has happened. I'm happy to be able to share it with you. And um, I, I really want you all to know that he is someone that we, the family is someone that we should all be proud of. They were a family just like any of us. Their sons are very brilliant. They're very enterprising, all of them. They've all been very successful in business. And here, Myrna and Jean Bennett from San Francisco, totally secular, have the only, their son is the only person that has ever worn a kippah in the Knesset. The only person who's been prime minister of Israel, who can say that he wears a kippah every day and puts on tefillin every day. I'm overwhelmed. So I just want to share that with you. It's great seeing you all. And I miss you all. Rina, I miss you. And um, it's been very special to be able to speak with you. Saba, it's very nice to meet you. And um, Michael, thank you for the invitation. Nina, thank you so much. That is amazing. Absolutely incredible. Uh, first of all, what you have done, you and Mordecai, and to hear a little bit about the special connection with Montreal. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank it you. is now my great pleasure to tell you that you are in for a treat. 
Dr. Chaba Nicoleni is insightful, eloquent, has an expertise that is just unique. And it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Chaba Nicoleni. Thank you very much. Really uh, to be introduced this way and to be invited in the first place back to the ADAT, uh, even if we can only do it virtually under the present circumstances. And really who could wish for a more perfect introduction to an event than what Nina has just uh, offered. This is just wonderful to actually have this very direct personal and personable connection with um, the subject, with the person that you're studying, that you are going to be talking about. This is, um, it's, uh, it's a dream come true. So uh, Nina, thank you so much, Rabbi Wittman, thank you so much. And I do have to add a very special additional thanks to you, Rabbi Wittman. It was a few weeks ago, it's probably a little bit more than that, uh, during one of the uh, daily Wednesday morning, uh, I think it was a Wednesday, um, in the daily discussions that you lead, you asked me if there was a chance that Yair Lapid would be the next prime minister. Now you were very careful, very wise about not asking me if I thought Mr. Netanyahu would continue remaining the prime minister because I would have jumped to say yes, because that's how I read the Israeli political process at the time, as many of my colleagues also did. But your question was about Yair Lapid. And with great self-assurance, I said, no, absolutely not. Now, in a certain sense, I proved to be correct, which is more than what many of us political scientists can usually claim. But of course, I also proved to be very, very wrong. It's possible that Mr. Lapid, under the agreement that he signed with Naftali Bennett, might rotate into the office of the prime ministership two years from now in 2023. But we do know that Mr. Netanyahu is not prime minister. And we do know that a third politician that neither you, Rabbi Whitman, nor I were talking about at the time, Mr. Naftali Bennett, is the prime minister. So thank you for inviting me back, even though I proved to be wrong, um, perhaps for the good reason. And so um, with that um, introduction, I end up going to probably switch in and out of screen sharing because I do want to share some interesting images, some inter interesting uh, visuals with you that I think will bear additional um, insight to share with you about my reading of Naftali Bennett and who he really is. And of course, since I am a political scientist, my particular take, my particular discussion and presentation about Mr. Bennett is going to focus on the politician, where the politician comes from. We now know where the religious young man came from, came from the Glicks. What I would like to do is to focus on where the politician came from and what might have accounted for the meteoric rise to the very top of the Israeli political establishment that he was able to accomplish. So even though Nina and I did not coordinate uh, the introduction and any part of the talk, we never actually met person to person until just a few minutes before the talk, I would like to pick up on something personal that, uh, that connects very nicely with what Nina said. And so here it is. On the 12th of February in 2013, so eight years ago, the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, met for its third session, third session shortly after the conclusion of the 2000, 2013 elections to what was the 19th Knesset. Now, the order of the day for this third meeting of the plenary was fairly straightforward. Following a brief presentation, a summary about the accomplishments of the previous government, which was, of course, already led by Mr. Netanyahu, the next several agenda items were maiden speeches. Now, a maiden speech is a speech that is given in Parliament, in, in the Knesset, by the freshly elected, newly minted Knesset members who are entering Parliament for the first time. On this day, the first maiden speech was given by a young man who walked up to the podium in a very unusual attire for an Israeli politic politician, wearing a beautiful uh, suit with a tie, very properly, uh, very properly tied. 
and with a beautiful kipasruga on his head. Of course, I'm not going to give away, I'm not going to, I'm going to give it away, I'm not going to hold it a secret. This young man was Naftali Bennett. Naftali Bennett started his maiden speech with the following story. He told the story, he recounted the story of one family meal at home when he was sitting together with the two brothers that Nina mentioned, as well as the parents sitting down for a meal. And the three boys were jokingly talking about a kid from the Shkuna, from the neighborhood, that everybody would only call the friar. The friar. Now, their mother didn't understand. Being an Ola from America didn't understand the concept of a friar. Who is a friar? What are you boys talking about? Now, the boys were equally surprised. Ima, how come you don't know what a friar is? Every Israeli knows that. A friar who is someone who takes a good beating, who takes a punch, and doesn't give any. Other looked at them, said Naftali Bennett on the Knesset podium, and said, well, if that is what uh, being a friar means, that is very good. And I want all of you boys to be friars. So Naftali Bennett took this message and called upon all the Israeli politicians right there and then, at the, in the opening paragraph of his first speech in the Israeli parliament, let us all be friars, us Israeli leaders, let us be friars for Israel. Just like the Halutzim, just like the pioneers who came to the land, who built it, who took a good punch, who took all the hardship and never hid back because only one thing mattered, and that was to build up the people and to build up the state, to build up the homeland. From that, quite a message, quite a message to actually call on the leadership to be friaring. Very few Israeli politicians would be daring to think that and to call upon their colleagues to, to do precisely just that. From then on, Naftali Bennett continued to lay out the vision, the vision that he had, that he wanted to accomplish upon entering the Knesset. And he talked about some very important points. And the reason why, friends, I would like to highlight these bullet points is to really keep our focus on this. And this will be very important because as I'm going to review the rise of the politician to the top of the Israeli echelon of power, we will have to decide whether we are seeing a young man who has been steadfast and resolutely committed to the same principle or whether, as the current right-wing opposition is trying to convince the rest of the Israeli public, he is a sellout, he betrayed the right-wing, he defrauded the voters, he is not to be trusted. To be sure, the new leader of the opposition, outgoing uh, Prime Minister Mr. Netanyahu, in his speech uh, just before Mr. Bennett was sworn in as Prime Minister, did tell the Knesset just a week and a half ago, people are celebrating in the streets of Tehran. They are celebrating because they know that Mr. Bennett is the prime minister. Just like Mr. Bennett, who told the Israeli voters during the election campaign that he would never work together with Lapid, Mr. Lapid, he would never join a Lapid government and look what he did. When he, when he tries to tell the world that he would never compromise Israeli security with respect to the Iranian nuclear threat, everybody knows that he is going to lie on that occasion as well. So there is that criticism. The right wing, the right led opposition criticizes Naftali Bennett for letting them down and not working towards the creation of a right religious government. And by the way, uh, his own religious commitment, the one that Nina so eloquently and beautifully told us about, is being very publicly undermined and questioned by the ultra-Orthodox Haredi leadership in the Knesset, saying, you're really not so committed to Torah and to Judaism. So Mr. Bennett has really, uh, is in need of a lot of koach, a lot of strength uh, to be able to withstand this criticism. But for us, Whether he is really a traitor or whether he is an example of a smart, brilliant politician who has not compromised his principles. And at the end of the talk, I would like to circle back to this question 
but ultimately you will see, of course, my answer unfold, but I am going to have to leave you to be the judges for yourselves to decide that and to answer that question. Back to Mr. Bennett's maiden speech. Once he has called upon the Israeli political leadership to be friars, and um, just, like, uh, just like that young kid in their Shkuna was, he laid out his vision for the future of Israel. And these were some of the key points he highlighted. Let's remember this is February 2013. He said, the cost of living is rising in Israel. There are great economic and social hardships. It needs to be resolved. Young Israeli families find it more and more difficult to find affordable housing, to find proper jobs. We need to look after that. We need to look after closing the fast uh, um, uh, and very rapidly increasing gap between haves and have-nots. Two, he called upon cracking down on the monopolies in the business world. He wanted to introduce, he made a passionate call for strengthening the free market in Israel. He explained that the strength of Israel, of Israeli enterprise and innovation lies in the creativity, in the ingenuity of the Israeli people. And that's what he called upon the uh, economic policymakers of the state to strengthen rather than making uh, the bureaucracy overwhelm with regulation the job of, uh, uh, of enterprise. And then he switched to something that the ultra-Orthodox world has found it very difficult to forget and forgive him for. He called upon, in no uncertain terms, equal sharing of the burden. He called upon revisiting the famous status quo agreement between the Zionist leadership and the ultra-Orthodox uh, leadership at the time of the creation of the state. He called upon working towards the, uh, revisiting the exemption of the ultra-Orthodox youth to make sure that young Haredi men would be drafted into the army. But he did that with great tact. He did that by emphasizing that the Haredim are our brothers and we need to do this. We need to make and implement this policy with great sensitivity and with great understanding. And then us that the strength of Israel and the future of Israel will not be determined on the battlefield. It will be determined in the psyche of the Israeli people. And for that, he claimed and he called for strengthening the Jewish connection, the Jewish spirit. In Israel's, in Israel's citizens, arguing that so long as Israeli Jews are proudly connected Jews, everything will be all right. And he recounted his example, his own experience in the Second Lebanon War, where he argued the problem was not tactical, the problem was not military. The problem was that the soldiers were confused. They didn't understand, they did not have the same kind of commitment that once upon characterized the Jewish soldiers of the Israeli army. So what a maiden speech. This is the maiden speech with which young Naftali Bennett entered the Knesset just over uh, 40 years old in 2013. It's very interesting and I'm going to show you, I'm going to now share and show you my first screen in a moment. Here is an image of uh, Mr. Bennett actually uh, speaking, giving that uh, maiden speech. And here, I would like to show you this very important scene. The first person who got up shaking his hand and thanking him for his speech was none other than Yair Lapid, who only at the same time burst onto the scene of the Israeli political system by bringing his own recently formed political party called Yeshatid with a phenomenal performance into the Israeli parliament. Look at this handshake. Look at this handshake. In 2013, and you fast forward to 2021, right? When the Israeli parliament swore into office the new government, led initially by Mr. Naftali Bennett, and then led uh, out, uh, according to the rotation agreement, to be led in 2023 by Mr. Yair Lapid. 
I, this is an important point. This is an important point because we need to be aware of that the connection, the political connection between the two politicians is not new. It did not start now. And I'm going to come back later on, um, as a matter of fact, in a few minutes to re-emphasize and provide a little bit further information uh, on this point. Now, on the next slide, what I would like to share with you uh, is the first time that the Anglo world in Israel met Naftali Bennett. The Anglo world in Israel met Naftali Bennett for the first time publicly on the pages of the Jerusalem Post newspaper, still, of course, the largest, the only, and the largest English language. Uh, and with the following news item. The news item was about the phenomenal success, business success, uh, claiming that the um, online payment security company, Sayota, that this young man had founded only six years prior in 1999, was bought by an American firm for a skyrocketing amount of $145 million. A phenomenal sense, a phenomenal success. And here you see uh, young Naftali Bennett smiling as a promising young entrepreneur. Of course, his uh, business success, his business venture uh, was a story of both successes and failures. Um, the success that eventually he was able to bring to this, um, to this successful conclusion uh, didn't come overnight. He went through some difficult times, having to, uh, having to lay off and fire many of his workers, but eventually uh, he was able to come out of the slump and, uh, and was able to land this phenomenal deal. The year after, in 2006, Naftali Bennett, like many of his um, similarly aged compatriots, was called upon to, uh, uh, to join the Israeli army in the Second Lebanon War. Now, that was a formative experience. And certainly in the maiden speech that I shared with you, um, the content of just a few minutes ago, also shows what an important impact uh, it had on him. During the Second Lebanon War, uh, Bennett saw the tremendous um, weakness that he felt and that he identified in the psychological preparation and resolution of the young Israeli soldiers. And that was something that he set out and he, with great determination, wanted to fix. So after the Second Lebanon War, Naftali Bennett decided to enter political life but not in the elective electoral realm first. His foray into politics actually owes a lot to his current deputy. Some people call her the deputy of Naftali Bennett in his political party, Yamina, but really her, his political partner and political twin, former Minister of Justice, Ayelet Shaked. Ayelet Shaked, also served like Naftali Bennett in the very elite units of the Israeli army, but unlike Naftali, Ayelet Shaked was an educator in the Golani. And leaving her army service, Ayelet Shaked, after a brief stint in the business world, found herself working for uh, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, who was at the time in the opposition and was leader of the opposition. Because Ayelet Shaked, who in 2006 recruited Naftali Bennett to join Netanyahu's inner core, because she identified in him a person with the strategic and tactical preparation that she thought, Ayelet thought, Likud needed at the time in order to bring Likud out of the opposition status and set the party eventually on the path towards recovering uh, electoral victory, electoral triumph, which they successfully did. So for uh, a couple of years, uh, until 2008, both Ayelet Shaked and Naftali Bennett worked very closely. They were really a part, if you will, of um, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu's inner core, inner political core. In that capacity, Naftali Bennett was also responsible, even at the initial stages of their uh, partnership, to orchestrating Netanyahu's victory in the internal Likud primary that solidified 
uh, the, the opposition leaders, then prime ministers, strong control uh, over the political party. And this is important to note. It is important to note that Naftali Bennett had a period of time when he worked very, very closely with Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu. Mr. Netanyahu owes a lot to him, both in terms of strengthening and consolidating his grip on, uh, on the Likud organization, but also developing a strategy, very successfully so, that eventually uh, uh, started the over one decade long period of Likud. Now, in 2008, um, there was a very drastic and abrupt um, break, if you will, between Nef the Netanyahu household, the Netanyahu inner core on the one hand, and Bennett and Ayelet Shaked on the other. Most Israeli pundits and newspapers that you might have read would try to convince you, and I'm not denying that this is very important, that there was a falling out, a personal falling out between the Netanyahu's, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife, Sarah Netanyahu on the one hand, and the political twins, Shaked and Bennett on the other hand. But I do want to stress the political background to this. And there was a very important political disagreement also on which they couldn't, uh, on which Bennett in particular and Netanyahu clashed. And that had to do with yet another politician who is going to play a very important role in the unfolding saga of the Israeli political drama that eventually concluded with the formation of the recent formation of Israel's 36th government. This third politician is none other than Mr. Avigdor Lieberman, the former uh, Olay from uh, the former so the Olay from the former Soviet Union, leader of the secular right-wing political party Yisrael Beitenu. Naftali Bennett wanted very much Likud and Yisrael Beitenu to merge. Bennett really wanted to solidify and he wanted to create one strong right-wing political party in Israel. And he saw in a prospective merger between Yisrael Beitenu and, um, and Likud, the beginning of this enterprise. And on this, eventually neither Lieberman nor Netanyahu agreed. And, even, and that because Bennett was identified very, very clearly with championing that position, eventually that started preparing the way uh, for his uh, gradual distancing from the Netanyahu's and the eventual, uh, and eventual exit from, um, uh, from the Netanyahu inner court. But it is very important, friends, to keep in mind, and I'm trying to sow the seeds of this as we go along, that Naftali Bennett's political vision from early on included, so we are talking about the mid-2000s, prospective cooperation with Avigdor Lieberman. When Lieberman talked about introducing civil marriage, when Lieberman talked about electoral reform, when Lieberman talked about um, uh, uh, ending the Haredi exemption from the draft, these were all policy positions that Naftali Bennett could work with, and they were part of his imagination in terms of where the Israeli political right should unfold. But the time wasn't yet ready, and the uh, and although in the 2013 election, Likud and Yisrael Beitenu ran on a joint ticket, uh, the full merger actually never, never took place. So what happened after 2008 uh, when uh, Naftali Bennett left the Netanyahu inner court? At that point, both Bennett and Ayelet Shaked identified the national religious, the Dati Laumi camp constituency in the Israeli political system as the to establish and create a base out of which they might be able to try to influence and possibly one day to take over the Israeli political right. And that they very successfully did. Capitalizing on the tremendous operational, logistical and tactical preparation that they amassed under uh, Netanyahu, Shaket and Bennett almost overnight took over the key institutions of the national religious community. At first, Bennett became chairman of the Council of uh, Yehuda, uh, of, um, of the Yesha Council, Yehuda and Shomron, Judea and Samaria, which is sort of the large umbrella lobby organization 
the successor to the Gush Emuni movement of uh, uh, once upon a time. And that, of course, gave him further organizational clout, further organizational connections. And then, before you know it, Naftali Bennett and Ayelet Shaked find themselves in leading positions of the political party that represents the Datileumi community at the time. And this was, of course, the Jewish home. So in the 2013 election, when Naftali Bennett for the first time entered the Knesset, it's very important to remember that he has behind him a tremendous electoral success. In that election, he increased the electoral fortune of the Jewish Home Party uh, 400%. In the previous Knesset, Habayit Hayehudi could only claim three Knesset seats. In 2013, it was up at 12. Right? So this is a tremendous success. And Bennett and Shaked are at the very forefront, at the vanguard of this tremendous revival of, uh, of the former Mavdal of the Re National Religious Party and the party alliance, because the Jewish home really was an alliance of the different religious Zionist political parties. It is at that time that Mr. Bennett starts his political career, his electoral political career. So, and in February 2000, 2013, he offers his maiden speech. Let me backtrack by one month. In January 2013, so just at the time of the Knesset elections, the New Yorker, not exactly a conservative outlet, the New Yorker magazine published a fascinating long, long article about Ayelet Shaked and Naftali Bennett. I'm going to show you uh, a picture as it's, I think, worth seeing. Here, here you see a picture uh, of the uh, political twins that were all set on taking over the Israeli political right. Because let us make no mistake, Likud understood that those 12 seats that in the 2013 election, Jewish home got were 12 seats that could have gone, at least some of those to Likud, but they did not. So Naftali Bennett and Ayelet Shaked are featured in the New Yorker, very important cosmopolitan liberal uh, publication, of course. And look what the journalist, what the, what the writer, I shouldn't say journalist, but what the writer, David Remnick, wrote in that article, quoting Ayelet Shaked. This is in January 2013. Ayelet Shaked was quoted to say, Bennett will be prime minister in 10 or 15 years. He is made of the right stuff. So clearly, Ayelet Shaked's crystal ball is much better than mine was because, as I mentioned, I, I wasn't able, able to foresee and give the right answer to, to Rabbi Whitman. Ayelet, what Ayelet Shaked had already been able to predict and foresee in January 2013. Now, after the Knesset elections in 2013, of course, the first thing that a newly, Knesset has, a newly elected Knesset has to do is to form a new government. And the key question, and of course, in this, after this election, Mr. Netanyahu and the Likud Yisrael Betinu Alliance was the largest party, so they were appropriately tasked to try to form uh, the next government. Very few people remember now, and it is very rarely talked about, that after the election, Mr. Naftali Bennett and Mr. Yair Lapid. Friends, this is a report from 2013, March, right from the time of the formation of the 33rd government. They decided to enter Netanyahu's government together. Neither Bennett nor Lapid would enter the coalition led by Netanyahu without the other. They did so in order to keep Netanyahu closer to the center. Because rest assured, both Lapid and both Bennett, as I mentioned earlier, were talking about ending or trying to end the exemption of the Haredi community from the draft, from the military draft. And so, so long as these two politicians together were in the government, clearly the Haredi parties would not want to share power with them. And indeed, they did not. So this moment, 
the moment of the embrace that you see here, um, uh, courtesy to the Times of Israel, was singularly responsible for keeping the con more conservative and the religious parties away from the Netanyahu coalition as early as 2013, keeping and forcing Netanyahu to be as closely aligned to the Israeli center as possible. And this is very important, friends, because again, we need to remember where the seeds of this collaboration, of this cooperation between Lapid and Bennett were sowed. So let me just sum up very quickly two important points. We had seen already that as early as 2006, 7, and 8, Bennett wanted Avigdor Lieberman, Yisra Betenu, and Likud to be closer together. He wanted them to merge. In 2013, Naftali Bennett already wanted uh, a close collaboration with Yai, Mr. Yai Lapid Yeshatid. A very important moment that kept Likud, for the time being at least, away from the more conservative uh, uh, right wing parties as well as the uh, ultra orthodox um, uh, Ashkenazi and Sephardi ultra, ultra orthodox parties. So, very, very important point uh, to keep in mind. Now, in the government that was formed uh, after the 2013 election, and this was a very short lived government, it only lasted uh, for less than for two years because then, of course, the next elections were called in 2015. Mr. Bennett served in office um, uh, in the portfolio of industry and, uh, and trade. In the 2015 election, he once again led uh, Habayit Hayahudi. Um, and although the electoral performance of the party was significantly uh, weaker, but it was still uh, impressive, the, the Habayit Hayahudi, the Jewish Home Party, came back to the 20th Knesset after the 2015 election with eight seats. In the new government, and this time, uh, Bennett enters on behalf of the Jewish Home a squarely right religious coalition, together with Likud and together with the uh, ultra-Orthodox parties. In this right religious coalition, Naftali Bennett uh, serves in various portfolios, but probably the most important legacy that he leaves behind is uh, in his capacity as Minister of Education. As Minister of Education, he marshaled two important policies, one was to um, reduce the size uh, of the, to rationalize really primary education and, uh, and reduce the size of, uh, um, of classes in, in, the, um, in the lower level kitot, in, in the classes, to make sure that students would be and pupils would be getting uh, closer attention uh, from, from their teachers. As Minister of Education, he also was responsible for overseeing the creation of the Beton Committee. Uh, the Beton Committee was a committee that was led by the um, uh, Israeli poet laureate and recipient of the, uh, uh, of the Israel Prize, Erez Beton, a uh, very important Mizrahi uh, poet. Um, and of course, his chairmanship of this committee, the committee which was tasked with the responsibility of advising the government about how to incorporate in a, the history, the culture, the tradition of Mizrahi Jewry in the mainstream educational curriculum. The fact that Erez Biton uh, was serving as chairman of this committee, uh, of course, spoke volumes about the dedication that Naftali Bennett uh, offered and uh, betrayed to, to this important cause. And again, we need to remember this in light of what he said in his maiden speech in 2013. He emphasizes the importance of our total Jewish spiritual historical pride and connection with everything that's Jewish, whether Ashkenazi, whether Sephardic, whether Mizrahi. And it is that total Jewishness that he wanted to encapsulate and celebrate and wanted to make sure that uh, the school cur curricula would also be giving a very, very important home to. And so in 2016, when he appointed and he oversaw the work of the Beton Committee, that is a very, very important legacy that, uh, that he left behind as uh, Minister of Education. 
And so I'm just going to show you a picture uh, as, uh, of uh, Minister of Education shaking the hands, of course, uh, of the iconic uh, Mizrahi poet of Israel. But the 20th Knesset would also usher in a new chapter in the political biography of Naftali Bennett. As we saw previously, he tried his flexing his political muscles. He tried out his political wings under the leader of Likud. Just camp. But towards the end of the 20th Knesset, as you see in these pictures, he leaves the Jewish Home Party at the very end of December 2018, when it was already clear that uh, new elections uh, would be held uh, early 2019 and formed a new political party uh, called the New Right. Together uh, in the Knesset, in the two female politicians, Shuri Moalem and uh, his political twin partner, Ayelet Shaked. It's very important that Ayelet Shaked also had a very important senior ministry in that Netanyahu government, and that was the justice portfolio. Now, the immediate reason for, Mr., for Naftali Bennett's decision to leave the Jewish home and start a new front, a new political party, the new right, um, the immediate cause for this was Netanyahu's refusal to appoint him as Minister of Defense when Avigdor Lieberman, who had that portfolio, bolted the coalition. Bennett demanded that he should be replaced or else he would take the party out of the coalition. Unfortunately, the organizational and the rabbinic leadership of the Jewish Home Alliance didn't support uh, Naftali Bennett's um, brinkmanship. And they asked him to back down and work with Netanyahu rather than force his hand in such a public and such a difficult manner. Even though what Bennett did was simply shrewd, clever politics, trying to bluff perhaps Netanyahu into giving him what he wanted so that uh, he would be able to fully um, implement his political vision. But that wasn't happening. And um, after he publicly backed down uh, from his demand, Naftali Bennett understood that his days uh, and his influence in the Jewish Home Party were numbered. So rather than waiting for another internal primary that might defeat him, uh, he started the new political party, Yamina. Uh, the Hayamin Hahadash at the time, and it metamorphosed into what we now call Yamina today. The new right political party truly wanted to usher in a new face to Israeli right-wing politics. Um, in a lecture that I was so uh, privileged to give uh, at the Adad before Corona, uh, so it was an actual live event, um, I actually called this um, the startup party uh, of, uh, of Indeed, in so many ways, Naftali Bennett and Ayelet Sheked just revolutionized the way in which conventional right-wing Israeli politics co uh, conducted itself. And probably at the very center was the flexibility that they were willing and able to introduce into um, the repertoire of the Israeli right. While they remained steadfast committed and resolutely committed to the key demands of the Israeli right, never to give up. Uh, on the settlements, never to compromise on uh, the uh, Israeli national secur security, never to compromise on the, um, uh, on the unity uh, of Jerusalem and the unity of, of the state. And that you are going to see in a few, in a few minutes, uh, he is a very steadfast opponent, uh, uh, has remained uh, as such of the two-state solution. Um, he was willing to compromise on other issues, such as the Haredi draft such as civil marriage, or if not that, at the very least, allowing local, allow the formation of local uh, Batei Din, uh, rabbinical courts, uh, that would be then able to supervise and officiate Jewish marriages, or under Jewish law. That he has always been very, very clearly and explicitly committed to and uh, on, on uncompromising. Um, of course, many of the methods uh, that they brought into right-wing politics, especially for a right religious political party, were also novel. Building on the success of Ayelet Shaked, a non-religious woman who claimed or who, who climbed very high up in the ranks of a religious right-wing political party, 
Naftali Bennett invited a number of other traditional but right-wing women to join their new political party. These initially included the very well-known English language publicist, Caroline, the sister-in-law of a uh, former mayor of Jerusalem, uh, and uh, Barkat, sorry, not Barak Barkat, and uh, Nir Barkat, uh, also um, uh, owner of uh, and chairperson of, uh, uh, of the football club in uh, Beersheba. And very importantly, so of course, over the past couple of years, both Barkat and, uh, and Glick uh, left uh, left the ranks uh, of, of the political party, if you will. Uh, but Shirley Pinto, a very well-known and a very highly esteemed advocate for, for the disabled. Um, she herself is actually the first uh, hearing disabled member entering the Knesset, in this Knesset, the first time. She was recruited into electoral politics by Naftali Bennett and by Yannette Chakel. And it was really very heartwarming and touching to see the first uh, early video clips that Ayelet Chakel and Naftali Bennett uh, using sight language uh, together with Shirley Pinto were, were offering. And so today we have two uh, very important um, uh, uh, advocates and champions in the Knesset for, for the Israeli uh, community. Uh, that suffer with uh, with various uh, physical and other uh, impediments and, and disabilities. And Shirley Pinto is one of them. So really bringing in bright, active women, um, not perhaps religious in terms of their um, visual self-identification, but certainly committed to and respectful of Jewish tradition and certainly Jewish right-wing politics and issues. And in many, many other ways, of course, Naftali Bennett also brought into the logistical operation of the, uh, of the new political party, his high-tech savvy and his, uh, and his high-tech knowledge. And um, if you only want to check out and see the, um, the um, online application that they designed for the new political party, uh, or the way in which they built up their social media presence. For me as a researcher, it was fantastic to, uh, to be able to really have, or try to get a close reading on the strategies uh, that, they, um, that they built up throughout the various electoral campaigns. Now, the first the baptism of fire, if you will, of this new political party came in the first of the series of elections that we've seen in Israel. And the first one was of course in April, 2019. And that was a flop. It was a flop in the sense that by a very narrow, narrow margin, but still Hayamin Hahadash, the new political party that Mr. Bennett and uh, the threshold that earlier on they were also very supportive of uh, uh, in, increasing to three and a quarter percent. So they missed it by just over a thousand votes. But it seemed that both Bennett and Shaked would be out of electoral politics as early as 2019. The very fact that they were able to come back in 2000, later on in 2019 in the second election, and then in the third election in 2020, really, they have to thank Mr. Netanyahu for it, who decided after failing to be able to form a government uh, in the spring of 2019, he decided to disperse the Knesset. So he asked the Knesset to pass uh, its own dissolution vote, which the Knesset did. And in the subsequent two elections, uh, the rebuilt now uh, and rebranded, no longer Hayamin Hadash, but called Yamina political party came back to power. It's very important to note that in the 2020 election, uh, which eventually resulted in the formation of the gun Netanyahu guns uh, national unity national emergency government that also oversaw the country's um, very difficult but also very successful battling against the corona pandemic. Yamina remained uh, in the opposition and it was from the opposition benches that they leveled a very persuasive, uncompromising attack on the government's seemingly sluggish response to the health crisis and for the great economic pain and for the great economic cost that the uh, public health strategies that the government chose seem to be costing. And friends, look at what the corona crisis did. 
the corona crisis did the following. The, thanks to this screenshot from uh, uh, that's one of the channels I certainly recommend following for contemporary uh, daily Israeli news. Look what happened. Uh, you see on the um, uh, the line indicated in yellow, the gradual popularity of Likud by Netanyahu dropping. And you see indicated by the white line, the gradual electoral popularity of Yamina led by Naftali Bennett closing that gap. There was a point where Naftali Bennett was actually touted to be rivaling Netanyahu as the most popular politician who is seen by a growing number of Israelis to be seen as a credible next prime minister. It was in that context that Yamina this time enters the fourth election with the following commitment. We are no longer going to be in Netanyahu's pocket. And that meant that when after the election, President Rivlin asked the various political parties to reveal whom they would recommend to be the next prime minister. Uh, the uh, Yamina, the party led by Naftali Bennett and Ayelet Shaked, chose neither Mr. Netanyahu nor the leader of the second largest party, Mr. Yair Lapid, but they put forward Mr. Naftali Bennett with only the support of their own single political faction, six, uh, seven members of parliament. It's now reduced to, to six. So everybody was very puzzled I mean, with a single digit number of seats behind him. Bennett wants to be prime minister? What a joke. At that time, I understood this as a remarkable uh, genius of a political strategy. And I told at every forum that I had uh, at the time that he is very smart. Bennett is definitely doing this in order to, of course, he will support Netanyahu. He could have chosen Lapid if he had, he could have chosen to support Lapid if he had wanted to. As we had seen, there was enough in their past uh, to suggest deeper collaboration, but he didn't. didn't. Clearly, he is doing this to force Netanyahu to give him everything that he wants to ask for in terms of senior portfolios and, uh, and policies. But I was wrong because that is not what Naftali Bennett wanted. He understood he could get more and more he did. As we all know, he eventually actually uh, ended up becoming the prime minister of the 36th government uh, of the state of Israel. I am not going to go, at least in the Q&A we can, but in the presentation, I'm not going to detail the process of the government formation because we agreed to focus the talk more on Naftali Bennett, the rise and perhaps the transformation of the politician. What I would much rather like to do in the remaining few minutes is to give you then a few vignettes uh, that might provide us with an insight into the kinds of policies, the kinds of values that he had and he has today. So in order to do that, let me share with you, first of all, a couple of quotes from his um, various, from the various moments when he served in the various ministries. So let's remember that Naftali Bennett enters the Israeli parliament for the first time in 2013. In May 2013, um, although that's not his portfolio, but as Minister of uh, Industry and Trade, this is what he has to say about the two-state two solution. I am strongly opposed to the establishment of a Palestinian state. And of course, I'm opposed to the separation of Jerusalem, our eternal city. To the on this issue from him. A few months later, in October 2013, in a parliamentary debate uh, about the nature of the Israeli economy, he actually called the Israeli left-wing opposition as the economic terrorist. They called them, he told them that they were launching an economic terrorist attack on the state. And in that speech, he said the following, you need to remember, governments do not create jobs. Rather, it is companies who create jobs. He wants free enterprise. He wants deregulation. 
very much what Netanyahu is boasting of having done, but perhaps not so successfully and not so completely yet. But then look what he said in August 2016 in connection with the Beton Committee. Partial Jewish and Zionist story. We are forgetting to tell the story of the Mugrabis, Mahane Israel neighborhood. On the annual school trips, our students do not visit Dimona or Yeruham to hear the wonderful story of the development towns. Everyone is familiar with the Kishinev program, uh, programs, but not with the programs in Morocco, which were another catalyst for Aliyah. Only part of the story is being told. And this is a shame for us all. And that is a shame that he wanted to, uh, that is a wound that he wanted to, to heal and, uh, and also uh, correct. And that was the story of the Beton Committee. Next, what I would like to show, it really will only take a couple of minutes, is to invite you to listen in with me on what Mr. Bennett had to say just a few weeks before he became prime minister, when the last uh, escalation of the conflict between Israel and Hamas, the last Gaza war, uh, was reaching uh, increasing and increasing uh, and increasingly greater proportions. Of course, Naftali Bennett became one of the most, because of his beautiful, brilliant, and flu brilliantly fluent English, he's one of the most frequently sought after commentators from the Israeli government in the uh, global or, well, specifically the, uh, the English, language, uh, uh, English language news world. And look what he had to say. And I think it's really quite telling. Tony Bennett, we should call a spade a spade here. Israel, Israelis and Palestinians are not on an equal footing, are they? And they haven't been for decades. From a military perspective, Israel's capabilities blow the Palestinians out of the water. And that's an understatement. Do you accept that it is Palestinian citizens and civilians who are suffering the most from this offensive being carried out, sir? They are suffering the most from their own government. The, I, I repeat, if you take any government in the world that places its uh, rockets and terror centers within schools, within hospitals, right now, the command of Hamas is in Shifa Hospital running a, a military uh, terror campaign against my family. So if anyone thinks that we're just going to tie our hands and uh, create this false morality, there's nothing moral about uh, uh, not defending your people. Any country is expected to defend its citizens. And you, Becky, should not be speaking about us. It's them. It's Hamas who needs to. It's deplorable what they're doing, using their own people as human shields. There's nothing more cynical than that. And, and I think the whole world should call that spade a spade. Okay, and just another short clip uh, on a similar theme. The fundamental situation is very clear. The Hamas has a constitution. United, the United States has a constitution. Well, in the Hamas constitution, they talk explicitly about murdering and destroying Israel. Uh, I'll read out of their constitution. Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will destroy it, just as it obliterated others before it. This is the Hamas constitution. So you have a, a state, a Palestinian Hamas state, whose goal is to destroy us. So obviously, we're going to fight back and we're going to defend ourselves. The notion that we will now have to uh, lay down arms is, is sort of like asking America to lay down arms on September 12th, uh, 2001, the day after 9-11. So they're starting the, this round at their uh, will, and they expect us to stop it when, it, when they run out of uh, ammunition or they're tired. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so that is Mr. Naftali Bennett on the issue of Hamas and Israeli national security as recently as just a um, couple of weeks before he became prime minister of a government that the newspaper, the daily newspaper Israel Hayom, cartoon in a very funny joking way, shows of course it this way, uh, is a very motley crew. It includes very strange bedfellows, but then politics does that quite often. It includes the leftmost members of the elements of the Israeli party system, the party Meretz, uh, the Israel Labour Party, 
for the first time in history, Israeli history, an Arab political party, uh, Ra'am, um, the United Arab List, uh, led by Mr. Mansour Abbas, is also a member, a responsible member of the government. And it includes several um, right-wing political parties, uh, secular right-wing political parties. In, their, in that regard, of course, Naftali Benetz Yamina tries to um, straddle a middle ground, but you have Mr. Gideon Sar's New Hope, you have Mr. Avigdor Lieberman's Israel Betenu, and of course you have in the center Mr. Yair Lapid's Yeshatid and Mr. Benny Gantz's Blue and White. With by now only six Knesset seats under his own immediate control, is Mr. Bennett going to be able to hold this government together? I don't know. I dare not to open up or consult another crystal ball of mine because my own training equipped me with reading and analyzing Israeli politics. I had known it, but Israeli politics, it seems to me, it seems to many of us has really become a new, has assumed a new stage. It is a new kind of Israeli politics. Perhaps the children, the generation of the startup nation are now also creating a new stage that we might be calling one day startup politics. All I can say with a straight face is that if there is one politician who could hold this very diverse government together, it is probably Naftali Bennett. And probably for the same reason why Ayelet Shaked expected him to be prime minister in, in 10 to 15 years, as early as 2000, 2013 because, as she said, he is made of the right stuff. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to end my presentation here and I will turn the, uh, the floor, the virtual floor, the screen, back to um, Rabbi Whitman and Stu. And if you have any comments, concerns, um, uh, if I inspired you, if I upset you, uh, I would love to hear. Um, and Stu, just please tell me uh, how you would like to manage the floor. Thank you. Okay, so, very much. so Chaba, first of all, thank you very, very much. So I've asked people, if you do have a question, to please put it in the chat. And so Chaba, I'll ask you to please look at the chat, select the questions you, you want to address. I, I do want to say one thing. Um, we value Chaba's ta time. He's given us this time very generously. So Chaba, I want you to please decide uh, how many questions you want to answer, but please choose from what's in the chat and please address them as you decide. Thank you very much, Rabbi Wittman. So uh, I will then, if I have um, control over the agenda, then I will take maybe liberty also to share some comments that uh, came in. And there is a comment from Brenda, Brenda Gewürz, who Brenda says the following, we did carpool for Mirna, uh, or Mirna to Hebrew Academy and also remained friends for many years after with both uh, Jim and herself. So thank you very much, Brenda, for this beautiful, beautiful comment. Um, Okay, uh, a comment or a question, a comment from uh, James Pigaman. I have to say, as someone who comes from deaf grandparents, one side of my family, it was very heartwarming to see Shirley Swan in, in Israeli Sign Language. Thank you, thank you, James, for sharing that. I, um, that's, that's just beautiful. Uh, I remember when we talked about uh, Shirley Pinto's initial candidacy back at the Adat. I will never forget that lecture. Uh, that was part of a lecture series on the new right. And we specifically talked about uh, her. Um, and it's just really, truly, truly wonderful. And of course, the Norwegian law now allows um, uh, and it made it possible for, for her to be advanced from the list, uh, even though because she was just a little bit lower placed, she is now in and They really, really brought new culture, new political culture, and new standards to Israeli politics. It's not the way we had known it before. I mean, the only other person who rose so quickly uh, with behind him to be was Ehud Barak. Now, that didn't work out so well for him in terms of longe longevity. Um, but, uh, but what Naftali Bennett has done, uh, this meteoric rise is really quite unparalleled. Um, a very uh, question from, uh, uh, from uh, Lor Lauren, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blessed. Uh, does Bennett still want to annex uh, Area C? 
Um, his position uh, about territorial issues has not changed. Uh, so, um, so my understanding is that that is where his preference lies, but it is my also, also my reading, Lauren, that um, with this coalition, he understands that he will not be able to do that. Um, if any major policy decision that would clearly rock or bring out into the open the division between the left and the right elements in the coalition uh, would, uh, would mean the end of the government. So if this coalition is smart, they will only focus on a select number of policy issues on which this very narrow coalition, because they really only are on the knife's edge, they can agree and then uh, not focus or not allow themselves to be brought into the more divisive issues, which of course the opposition is uh, trying to, uh, to entice them into. Those of you who are following the daily Israeli political news might be aware of the, um, uh, of the proposed amendments to the citizenship law, the, uh, specifically with respect to the unification of, uh, of uh, Arab families, um, uh, which, the, um, which, which the government wants to renew the uh, temporary legislation that forbids the, um, the unification of families of Palestinian Arab families with Israeli Arab families. Um, and so there is a big um, standoff right now between the uh, right religious opposition uh, on the one hand and the government. Um, so um, we'll have to see how that uh, test, how the government is going to meet that test. Um, Rabbi Whitman, oh, sorry, that's just a comment. Uh, a comment from Noah, Noah Ogilvy. Um, uh, just, I cannot not say that Noah is a former student of the, at the Azrieli Institute. She's a graduate of the Israel Studies minor, and of course, a Bachelor in Fine Arts, recently completed. Uh, Noah, I hope you permit me for saying this, a Master's in Diplomacy at Carleton University, and has been recently admitted to do a master's, another Master's degree at IDC Herzliya. So I'm going to Israel, so I'm just so delighted to see you here, Noah. I would have said that even if we were in the, in the actual classroom, so I hope you forgive me. Uh, your question. There are lots of pro-Israel progressives and liberals writing online that Naftali Bennett is right-wing, but Lapid will keep Yamina's right-wing agenda in check. Do I agree? Will Lapid and his center-left alliance maintain a true center government left uh, by Bennett until Lapid takes over? So I would like to say two things, um, uh, Noah. First is that, and this is why I think it's important to remember where the collaboration between Lapid and Bennett uh, came from and where it started. It really goes back as early as to 2013. The two of them together wanted to keep Netanyahu in check. That's why like, the first party that signed with a, co a coalition agreement with Netanyahu after the 2013 election was Tzipi Livni's Hatnua. And then the question was, okay, which other parties can Netanyahu bring in? And it's at that point that Bennett and Lapid got together, forcing Netanyahu's hand not to go further, further to the right. So Bennett was very much, as much part of keeping Netanyahu in the center as Lapid was. And so I think that, I, I don't know what these commentators say. I mean, I mean, I know what they say, but what I think it's, it's, there's no denying that Bennett has a lot of very strong right-wing views. You saw that in the clips, and I think you also saw that in the quotes on the economy, on the two-state solution, on the issues with Hamas, national security, right-wing, uh, Meahus, 100%. But there are also important issues where he breaks ranks with the rest of the Israeli right. And that's where he's been partnering with Lapid, and that is not new. Now, having said that, uh, there, there is this sense that for Bennett uh, to last in office until the rotation comes, he will have to give up and compromise on his right-wing politics. Because if he wanted to pass any major right-wing policy, he would only be able to do that with the opposition. Because, and possibly with some of the right-wing parties uh, in the coalition. Gideon Sars. But if that were to happen, then of course the coalition would break up. So the fear, if you will, in the Netanyahu world is that Bennett may actually compromise on the right-wing issues in order to stay in power until the rotation time comes. 
may be the source of possible check or constraint on Bennett's right wing core. And again, I do want to stress Noah once again that Bennett has a right wing core, but it's a new right. right? So on issues of uh, Jewish marriage or rather the uh, Orthodox, um, uh, the way uh, the, the ultra Orthodox monopoly on marriage and the administration thereof in Israel, which he is in favor of relaxing, is certainly one issue that, uh, that I would mention that he breaks ranks with them. Uh, and, um, and of course, the draft is another important and, and big issue. So um, Lapid doesn't really have to do much to keep Bennett in check. So there is enough built into the parliamentary arithmetic as it is right now that should compel him to do so. Uh, another comment from James Spiegelman. When and if Lapid does take over, it would stay centric because Bennett would still be there. A very important comment. And that's if, if they, yes, if they balance carefully. But of course, we need, you're right, James. But it's very important also to keep in mind that Israeli politics has entered this and continues to be rather in this very difficult to navigate multi dimensional space. It's no longer just conventional left, right, and center according to which parties are positioning themselves. It's also according to a whole set of other issues, certainly one of them um, being very important is whether you oppose or whether you support Netanyahu uh, and his personal leadership. So, um, so that's also an important part of that. So uh, thank you, James. Uh, a question from uh, Lea Adoni and another Concordia student. Lea, I hope you uh, allow me to, to say that. Lea actually recently presented about um, the Beton Committee and Mizrahi identity at a student conference at UCLA. And so we're very proud to have Lea represent the university and, uh, and, the, and the institute. So uh, what do you think the future of Mizrahi representation will look like under Bennett in the context of the Beton Commission? Well. Um, this should be something very easy in terms of representation of Mizrahi issues and culture in the school curricula. This should be very easy for this government to strengthen, to, to strengthen the implementation and the deepening thereof. So uh, if um, there were one issue where there should be very strong and clear congruence of support, and this should be, this should be uh, one of them. Uh, in terms of the political representation of the Mizrahi, that's, that's hard because, of course, there are several Mizrahi in, in uh, and, and there is a very strong Mizrahi political attachment to Likud that continues to be very strong, and of course to Shas. So, um, so in terms of the changing that, changing the political reorient reorientation of the Mizrahi constituency in an electoral sense, I'm not. Uh, I don't know. I, I, my crystal ball doesn't see that so clearly. Uh, a question from Nitsi. Um, as someone who admires Bibi, Ayelet, and Bennett and voted for Yamina, thank you for uh, that. Uh, thank you for admitting. Uh, thank you, Nitsi. Uh, because of their strong platform, I feel that he has indeed betrayed his constituents and his own long held positions. Why should we trust his leadership? As we know from other prime ministers, power is very addictive. What do you think? Well, that's, um, I th uh, yes, that is exactly the fear. Uh, that is exactly the source of the doubt and the um, sense of betrayal that those, who, many of the people who voted for him um, uh, feel, in, uh, uh, feel about Naftali Bennett. And that's exactly why I started the presentation by putting that sense of betrayal the, uh, the, the idea of defrauding, that's a sense of defrauding the um, uh, significant uh, right-wing uh, electoral constituency right uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Um, it's, um, it's going to, he's going to have to work very hard to convince uh, his own electoral constituency that what he is doing in his government uh, is going to further some of those policies that he promised in the first place. Now, right now, of course, we see that that's a very tough sell. Because Amihai Shikli, one of the members of the political of his political party, Yamina, already left him, and it really seemed uh, for a moment that even Nir Orbach, um, formerly from the Jewish Home, might also bolt the coalition. Um, and so there, there are there is this. 
front front, even uh, in the Yamina parliamentary faction. There is no denying that that sense of betrayal is there. Um, and that's the criticism coming from the opposition that he sold out just in order to get into power. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for him to, uh, to prove that argument wrong. Um, let me just put it this way, Nitsi. If I had voted for him in the last election, I would be probably sharing your sentiment, um, but I would be probably also listening to what he is trying to do now and next. Because I would also remember that many of these policies that he had promised really date back to the very beginning of his political career in 2013. So um, yes, politicians often make promises um, and we are lucky if they keep some of them. So perhaps if he manages to do that, if he manages to keep some of the promises, uh, if those are important ones, maybe we are all better off. But I know it's a very it's a difficult argument to make. Uh, and if I were you, I would be angry with me too for saying what I just said. Um, a question from uh, Nathan. Uh, uh, Nathan, another uh, student, uh, I think joining us from France. Uh, I think that's where you are, Nathan. So another student from Concordia, it's wonderful to see you. So I um, had the opportunity to read an article about Yossi Cohen saying he was considering running for prime minister, Yossi Cohen, the former chief of the Mossad. Do you think this could be possible? Because it would be a good opportunity for Israel to increase its relations with the Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia, since Yossi Cohen is the architect of the Abraham Accords. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so indeed, Yossi Cohen uh, was touted recently as a possible next leader to, um, who expressed interest in entering politics in the electoral sense and his interest in joining Likud. Um, I don't know. I don't know if this would uh, happen. I don't know if this would be a good idea. Um, because for all the, all the things that you mentioned Nathan, are correct, absolutely. But like Benny Gantz, who didn't have an, any electoral experience behind him, he's learning the hard way. It's not so easy. Important contribution and service that you ran and offered to the state before. And we need to remember that there are other very accomplished politicians in Likud who already started for replacing or to be potential successors to Mr. Netanyahu. Nir Barka, uh, former mayor of Jerusalem, who uh, joined the Likud Knesset team, uh, had a big rally, where, a big rally in Tel Aviv, where he, I mean, he didn't say it explicitly at, in, in that context, but earlier he did say that when Netanyahu leaves, he would be ready to, to join. Yuri Edelstein, uh, former speaker of the Knesset and former minister of health, also indicated his readiness to, um, to take on um, the leadership of Likud. So there are other contenders. If Likud wants to come back to power, it needs to make sure that the leadership fight, if and when Bibi Netanyahu is no longer uh, in leadership, is going to be contained and not going to rip uh, the party apart. Um, and the party learned that the hard way under Arya Sharon. Um, and we have a question from Frema. Uh, Frema, it's very nice to, uh, to see you again. Um, uh, oh, thank you so much. That's a very, very sweet comment. Thank you very much, Frema. It's always lovely to, to see you and, and, and all old and, and new friends. Um, so Rabbi Whitman, I don't see any other comments and- No, I, I, I think you've, you've answered every single one. So uh, let me just take a moment. Um, every time I listen to Chaba, not only does he put everything in perspective so that I can understand what's happening, but he also gives a roadmap of what to look for going forward. And today, Chaba, you have done exactly that it is so impressive to hear so succinctly, so eloquently, an understanding of the background, the present, and what to look for in the future. Chaba graciously shares his expertise with us on a regular basis at ADAP. And I just wanna express my gratitude to you for being so generous uh, with your time and expertise. 
And I am proud to call you my friend and my colleague. Thank you very, very much. I wanna thank everybody for joining. I wanna wish everyone a very good day and please come back to our programming in the future. We look forward to providing Chaba in the future and much more in the upcoming months. Thank you all very, very much.